Gambo, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our esteemed participants. My name is Dr. Margaret Karembu, Director ISA Afri Center, based at the International Livestock Research Institute, ILRI, here in Nairobi. We are so excited to host this webinar on animal biotechnology, which is a slight shift from pro-biotechnology, our usual brand, over the last two decades or so. Thank you so much for joining us as we explore this next frontier. I would like now to invite our IT technical facilitator, Godfrey, to, to start us up with house rules. Godfrey. Thank you, thank you so much, Margaret, and uh, welcome everyone. So in order for us to have a smooth meeting, uh, there are a number of uh, rules that we all need to observe. So kindly note that this webinar is being recorded for our future reference. And please ensure that you log into the webinar with your actual name as opposed to the device name so that we know who we are engaging with. So you will notice that your video and mics are automatically disabled during the talk and this is so we can avoid background noise. Uh, during the discussion session there will be two ways of um, asking your question and um, maybe fronting a comment. So the first one is that you can type in um, the Q&A section and uh, you can also raise your hand to ask a question. And in both cases, kindly be brief and be specific on um, which, uh, which partner is this question is being addressed to. And finally, kindly join this webinar in a quiet place with stable network. Thank you so much. Back to you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, Godfrey. So again, a very warm welcome to those who are not uh, there before I started. So this webinar is a direct response to a frequently asked question during the launches of our signature product, uh, the annual global status of biotech crops. The question is, how about progress in animal biotechnology? So at ISA, we have taken this up and we believe starting these conversations with the global community would encourage constructive dialogue in the animal biotechnology sphere uh, to ensure that we don't have the endless debates that have witnessed the crop biotech sphere over the last two decades. Animals, as many of us know, occupy such a special place in the universe, from the spiritually inclined as part of our culture, the economy, and such a wide habitat, the air, the land, and the water. On the face value, however, biotech applications in animal research seem to have taken a back seat or are behind the plant side. But maybe not. To get the better insights, on what has been happening in that field and facilitate a more informed dialogue. We have with us a team of highly experienced animal science experts to break it down. They are, our first speaker will be uh, Dr. Simon Liliko, who is a core scientist at Roslyn Institute and Center for Tropical Livestock Genetics and Health at the University of Edinburgh. Simon's academic training is in molecular parasitology. He has worked widely with precision breeding tools such as talents and holds several patents in this field. He is also the editor in chief of transgenic research. Our second speaker is Professor Steve Kemp. You can see him through the window right here in Ilri campus, although I see like he has traveled to some beach is the program leader for livestock genetics program at ILRI and professor in tropical genetics at the University of Edinburgh. His research interest is in genomics of tropical adaptation, particularly host pathogen interactions and mechanisms of tolerance and persistence, as well as informatics systems. Our third speaker, all the way from the US, is Dr. Mark Walton, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Aqua Bounty, technologist in the USA. His career encompasses plant and animal genetics and biotechnology. He has worked as a research scientist, research manager, and in the regulatory affairs. He has been involved in commercializing biotechnology for over 20 years and is an industry leader in the continuing discussions with governments on the regulation of genetically engineered animal products. So, that is the team, our dear participants, that we have assembled for you. They are going to speak each for 10 minutes. Then after that, we are going to have the conversation through a discussion Q&A. And our conversation will be moderated from the Philippines.
Philippines by ISA Southeast Asia uh, Center Director, Dr. Rodora Aldemita, fondly we call her Ola, with our global coordinator, Dr. Maha, all the way from Malaysia, concluding the session for us. So with that uh, brief remark and introduction, once again, a very warm welcome to this webinar. And we'll now project our first poll question, after which the speakers will take the floor. So Godfrey, could you please put the first poll? It's already on the screen. Thank you, Margaret. So we'll take 30 seconds to, to vote uh, to answer that question. I will display the results, then we can proceed to the first panelist. I am displaying the results now. There you go. Fantastic. Okay. So, Simon, you can take the screen. Okay, maybe would you like to project the second question so we can move faster as he comes back? That's right. So, I'm putting up a uh, second poll. There you go. We'll take 30 seconds. All right, uh, adding Paul and displaying the results now. There you go. <laughs> okay, so that is how we have polled. We'll, uh, in our concluding remarks, you'll see how best to address this. And also our speaker, Steve, will, also, will be addressing some of the issues that this question has. Uh, brought now i still can't see simon so maybe as he repairs his uh, technical uh side we could go to the next speaker uh professor steve kemp you can take the floor and then we we, we still can take up after simon comes back okay thanks very much margaret uh let me just get my screen sorted here Thank okay, you. So thanks. Thanks. Have 10 minutes. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Margaret. And thanks for the opportunity to talk about talk about some of this stuff. In some ways, it might make more sense for me to come before Simon anyway, because um, I, I, I want to give a sort of very general overview of some opportunities. Um, so, sorry, that didn't advance as I expected it to. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I think oh, just to restate the point that. Uh, improvement in agriculture is driven by diversity um, and traditional genetic improvement uh, works by exploiting diversity. It's just that we exploit it without understanding uh, the mechanism um, behind, the, the, behind the systems that we're trying to, we're trying to enhance. Um, and so, you know, for ever, ever since life emerged and ever since uh, agriculture emerged and uh, nature and people have, have worked with diversity to modify phenotype. And that's worked both within species and across species. There's this very nice example, uh, which some, some people may be familiar with, uh, which shows that uh, modern sweet potatoes uh, are in fact based on a natural transgenic event that, that happened, uh, uh, that happened an unknown uh, time ago. Um, uh, but those, those tra naturally transgenic uh, sweet potatoes uh, produced larger tubers and they were selected by, by early farmers. And the whole, the whole basis of, uh, of sweet potato agriculture is now based on a, on a natural transgenic event. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the, the important point is that, that the world changed with uh, discovery of, of, of technologies that allowed genome editing. Um, until until talons and CRISPR technology came along, uh, a lot of people were hunting genes, trying to find genes associated with particular traits. But having got them, there was really nowhere they could go. Um, it was difficult to to validate a, a, a genetic variant, and it was, and it was difficult to to deliver on a genetic variant. Um, but uh, CRISPR. Cas9 and, and related technologies, which allow very high precision genome editing, changed the world completely. And that was really the basis behind the formation of the Center for Tropical uh, Genetics and Health, uh, CTLGH, 
funded by uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and, and uh, the UK DFID. It was that recognition that 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 technology had suddenly jumped and, and it was it was suddenly worth a new embarking on a new set of investigations to identify genes and then to exploit them. So I'll be very quick example um, of use biotechnology. Uh, one resistance to trypanosomiasis. So I'll briefly mention the use of surrogate sires to, to deliver improved genetics. And finally, the use of, of biotechnology to cryopreserve uh, poultry primordial germ cells. Um, so just to mention African trypanosomiasis, it's an extremely important pathogen by tetsifies, uh, and it's estimated to cost something like a billion dollars annually across Africa and related species and animals. And to, to note that livestock was of, of human disease. There are some species of, uh, of trypanosomes only occur in humans, some only in livestock, and some for which livestock are reservoirs of human disease. Um, so it was noticed a while ago that, that humans uh, are resistant to some livestock trypanosomes. And the reason for that is they have a protein, APOL1, APO, apolipoprotein 1, which lyses trypanosomes, and that's what you can see in the right panel there, a bunch of burst trypanosomes because they've been exposed to primate uh, apolipoprotein 1. So uh, we, we came up with the idea of, of putting a, a construct based on primate apo, apolipo 1 uh, into uh, the Rosa 26 locus uh, of cattle uh, in the hope of, conf of making them produce a primate type uh, uh, trypanolytic factor which would protect them against uh, all species of trypanosomes. Uh, and we demonstrated this in mice. If you look at that top line, the purple line, that's mice protected with apolipoprotein derived from baboons. Baboons have, uh, have a particularly powerful trypanolytic factor which gives resistance to all species of trypanosomes. Uh, the black line that comes crashing down is, uh, is normal mice, uh, non-transgenic mice. And the green line is mice which have a construct in them from human apolipoprotein 1. So that nicely demonstrates um, the difference, it nicely demonstrates that our system is working and that we've, that we're, that baboon uh, trypanolytic factors protect against all species of trypanosomes and, uh, and human apolipoprotein protects against, does not protect against human infected trypanosomes. So we then uh, derived this different, uh, essentially if you look down the, uh, uh, the left-hand flow, uh, the intent is to design a, lipo, uh, a trypanolytic factor that would kill all African trypanosomes. Um, and I'm just realizing I should be using a pointer at this point. Can I use that? Uh, and um, sorry, one sec. Why can't I see my laser? Laser pointer, right. So, um, and then validate that in mice as I've just demonstrated and, and construct a make a construct suitable for putting it into cattle. In parallel, we need to clone, we need the ability to clone uh, cattle. Uh, um, and so we set up a bovine embryonic fibroblast cell culture system uh, and successfully cloned uh, a baran. Um, and the, the final step of this is to combine these two, is to put the construct into, uh, into the, uh, the bovine embryonic fibroblast cells and transfect them into recipient brands to produce uh, to produce uh, resistant to trypanosomiasis. This final step has not yet been completed, uh, so we are we've made very substantial progress, but we are having technical difficulties in that final step for reasons we don't fully understand. And importantly, we've since the start of this, we've maintained stakeholder engagement. We've been talking with regulators and and, and the public. Uh, I'm going to skip that a little bit, and let's so so that's so let's jump to the second of my two examples, and that's the use of surrogate sires to uh, to enable genetic improvement. 
So this is a, a, a concept developed by John Oatley at Washington State University. Um, and, and basically the problem is that if, if you gave me today the absolutely perfect goat or the perfect cow for African smallholder systems, I would really struggle to get those out, to make them available to African farmers, because uh, it would be a very slow process to, to, to introduce that genetics across across a population uh, with very small herd size very uh, and very scattered with artificial insemination systems that don't really work very well. So John came up with this system uh, in which you, uh, you, you knock out a gene within a, a recipient sire so that it no longer produces its own sperm. You take your elite sire, the male that's got the genetics that you want, and this might be a cow that's resistant to trypanosomiasis, or it might be a goat that's, that's particularly heat adapted. Uh, you culture spermatogonial stem cells from this guy and you put them into the recipient. So now you have a recipient male whose sperm is not his, but is derived from uh, a, a donor elite animal. And you can make thousands of recipients from one, from one elite buck. So suddenly the, uh, you, can, you can now distribute these males around and they will pass on a recipient, uh, they, they will pass on uh, sperm from, from the donor. And so suddenly instead of having just one uh, elite buck, we've got uh, potentially thousands and thousands and we can distribute those and make them available to small scale farmers. So that's, a, uh, I think, a very interesting and important technology that might, that might allow distribution of improved genetics. And finally, the third aspect that I want to touch on is the use of biotechnology for conservation. And here we, we're looking at the example of poultry. Uh, um, right now, we are working very hard to improve the genetics of, of, of smallholder poultry systems. And we're rolling out uh, improved genetics, crossbred genetics. Um, but we're acutely aware that there are very highly adapted local indigenous breeds that are not very productive, they don't produce many eggs, they don't grow very fast, but they're very well adapted uh, to, a, to a low input diet, scavenging. They're, they're very tolerant of, of disease and very tolerant of, of environmental abuse. So it would be a tragedy if they were lost. So what we're doing at the same time uh, as improving um, smallholder poultry system is, is making sure we make a backup of existing diversity. And that's been enabled through a collaboration with Mike McGrew um, at the Rosted Institute uh, he's developed a system for, um, for culturing um, primordial germ cells and that's been exported to Ilri where we've established the technology and we've preserved uh, uh, seven ecotypes um, from Kenya, five ecotypes from Tanzania and one ecotype from Ethiopia. Um, as a proof of principle, uh, it's, it's worked very well. Uh, it's a relatively simple technique and, uh, and Mike is working on making it even quicker and simpler. And pulled out in collaboration with the African Union, uh, AUIBAR, the African Union International Bureau of Animal Resources. We're working with them who have got national gene banks uh, across the continent. We're working with them to transfer this technology so that so that national partners can take responsibility for conserving their own poultry, uh, their own poultry diversity. And until this technology came along, it was extremely difficult to uh, to preserve, to, to cryopreserve uh, poultry systems. Uh, it's not like it's not like in mammals where you can conserve sperm or uh, sperm or ova. So yeah, so I, I've touched on, on on three areas, and I and I, there's a kind of logic to my choice there. Um, uh, I spoke about using natural variation to improve performance. Uh, I spoke about using biotechnology to make that improve, those improved genetics available to farmers. And finally, I spoke about um, uh, conserving the unique diversity as we attempt to improve. We want to be very careful that we, we don't destroy um, diversity that we don't yet understand and we don't know what, what its potential might be. Uh, I'm going to finish thanking a, a whole lot of people uh, but I particularly touched on work uh, led by Mike McGrew from the Roslyn Institute, Christian Tiambo here at Ilry, John Notley uh, in Washington State, and Jane Raper at, at uh, City University of New York, who's led the 
uh, trypanosome resistance work. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. So our next presenter is Mark. You're going to present next because uh, Simon is having a challenge. The whole of the Institute's uh, network has gone down, so he's trying to sort out. So we can, we'll have him at the end. Thank you. So Mark. All right, Margaret. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to, to, uh, to share Aquabounty's story with everyone. Let's see if I can get my screen up. There we are. That working? Everybody's okay yes, with that, right Margaret? Now. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, all right. Good. All right. Well, so first of all, I think it's, um, again, thank you everyone for uh, the invitation and, and for those of you on the, that are listening in, thanks for participating. Let me share with you the Aqua Bounty story and, and Steve just gave us a, a great overview of how biotechnology um, can impact on agriculture, on livestock agriculture. And um, the real fun thing about being part of Aqua Bounty is that we've, we, Aqua Bounty has progressed to the other end of the spectrum where we're actually bringing a product of biotechnology to market. So let's just jump right to a little bit of history. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Aqua Bounty, uh, we are a, a seafood production company. We're headquartered in uh, Massachusetts in the United States. We have a farm in central Indiana, a small town called Albany, Indiana, and our hatcheries are located on Prince Edward Island in um, Canada. And the timeline on your right, the key milestones, um, I think one of the things that's, that a lot of people who are familiar with Aqua Bounty are, are aware of is that it actually has taken the company quite some time to get to market. Um, the first, and as opposed to, to some of the technologies that Steve was talking about, Aqua Advantage salmon are transgenic. And I'll, I'll, next slide, I'll show you, I'll share with you a little bit about the transgene. But um, the, uh, the first Aqua Advantage salmon was actually generated back in 1989. And uh, that was done at Memorial University in Canada. And then Elliot Entis, who founded Aqua Bounty, got involved, saw the potential for the fish, um, and created Aqua Bounty and began working towards getting regulatory approval. So the first, um, the first regulatory filings took place in 1995. In the United States, the US Food and Drug Administration is responsible for regulation of animal biotechnology products. So over the, the ensuing 20-year period. Um, the, the agency learned a lot about regulating animal biotechnology. Aqua Advantage learned a lot about being a regulated product and ended up in 2015 with an approval of Aqua Advantage. Um, so it's approved from a safety, uh, a human health uh, food safety standpoint, and it's been approved from an environmental safety standpoint. We've also obtained approvals in Canada. Um, prior to 2015, uh, it was approved for production in Canada. In 2016, under the Canadian regulations, we re uh, obtained approval for um, the, the consumption of uh, salmon fillets from Aqua Advantage. And then in 2017, the company purchased a farm in Indiana, an existing uh, aquaculture facility. And for those of you who, are, who see me, all right, well, when you saw me or when you see me again, you'll see a picture of our farm, of the, the grow out area of the farm. And then uh, 2018, we started operations with conventional salmon and that's uh, our line, but non-transgenic. 2019, the first Aqua Advantage um, salmon eggs were, were moved into the farm and we are in the process, we're all probably four or five months away from harvesting the um, Aqua Advantage. We've, we've begun harvesting salmon from the farm, the conventional salmon, but then the Aqua Advantage salmon, the transgenic salmon, will begin harvest later this year. So the Aqua Advantage salmon uh, and a promoter from a fish issue, um, the, what, what it also does 
does though is it stimulates the appetite. And so our fish um, grow more quickly. Um, they're hungry all the time. They feed and they grow more quickly. The, the Aqua Advantage salmon, the actual commercial product is a triploid and hemizygous, that is it only carries one copy of the transgene. And uh, you can see the, the statement here, this is the actual description that the Food and Drug Administration uses that significantly more Aqua Advantage salmon grow to a uh, given weight 100 grams um, than non-transgenic comparators within 2700 degree days. And on the, in the graph here, you can see that these are the two transgenics. This is diploid, this is triploid. And then these are the non-transgenic comparators, and this is 100 grams body weight. Um, the reason that we use triploid, um, the, the fish, I, I think I said they're all female as well. So they're all female triploid, so they're sterile. Um, and that is an environmental protection. That's the reason for the, the sterility. And the picture, uh, the picture is, is age-matched siblings um, at between 12 and 15 months. And so the, obviously the transgenic fish on the bottom and two non-transgenic siblings um, on the top. The, I, I've already talked about the fact that faster growth was the primary focus, but there are some other advantages that come from, um, from the Aqua Advantage uh, construct. A big one is that we are, the, the fish is more feed efficient than the, the non-transgenic. In fact, about, according to our data, 25% more feed efficient um, than non-transgenic. And um, we grow ours in fresh water. Uh, those of you who might think that salmon have to be grown in, in salt water, that's not correct. They, they grow just fine in fresh water. And so what that does is it enables us to establish farms um, inland. Uh, we don't have to have access to, to salt water or create make salt water, we can use fresh water. And then another key uh, fact, uh, another key advantage of, of the, the Aqua Advantage salmon is because we can grow it close to markets, um, we have a lower carbon footprint. And in the United States, over 80% of our Atlantic salmon um, are, come from Chile. Um, is the primary source now. And compared to a Chilean salmon in the fish case, our salmon have about a tenth of the carbon footprint of the, the uh, salmon that come from outside the United States. So um, a, a strong, a large environmental um, value there. Um, the reason that we're excited, one of the, we're excited about this for a lot of reasons, as you can imagine, but I think as all of us on the call, on the webinar know, um, there's a, a great deal of pressure on our, uh, on us in agriculture to be able to produce the, the food that's required for sustainability as we go forward. Um, and the point I want to make here is that, you know, fish are an important protein source. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Fish are an important protein source and about 90% of the world's fisheries are actually overfished. Um, and, and so the opportunity to, the ability to increase productivity from fisheries um, is very, very limited. And if uh, most um, Atlantic salmon, almost all Atlantic salmon is farm raised. Most of those farms today are cage, net cage farms that are grown in coastal areas, Norway, Chile, Canada, and the availability of um, coastline for more farms is limited as well. So seafood um, is a potential, is, is a, actually a very important source of protein for, uh, for the global population. And this slide makes a couple of points. One, of course, is that the, the feed conversion of, uh, of seafood of many of the marine organisms is better than it is for any other livestock species. Um, the expectation is that um, aquaculture is going to have to produce 60 million additional tons of fish by 2050 to fill the, uh, what, what we're calling and others call a seafood gap. So there's a growing demand and interest in seafood, um, and yet the availability is pretty limited. It's flat. The, the amount that's available is relatively flat because of overfished natural fisheries and limited production capability for fish like salmon in, in current aquaculture. So 
we're using Aqua Advantage salmon as a way to address that seafood gap. Um, shifting our salmon production from the, the from the a marine environment or a marine environment to a land-based uh, recirculating aquaculture system environment, we're using freshwater tanks and um, the the technology to um, filter the water, clean the water, um, you reuse the water. So, by the way, one of the points I haven't made yet is in our farm in Indiana, where about 95% of the water is recirculated. Um, we're designing the next farm right now, and that will be about 99% reduced protein. Um, and then, as I or, and then of course the third the third leg of our stool, if you will, is that our the genetically modified Aqua Advantage salmon um, grow more quickly, reach market weight. We reach market size in about between 16 and 18 months compared to 24 months, uh, yeah, actually, call it, I'm sorry, 36 months for uh, conventional fish. So having great technology and a product that works um, is good, but the question, of course, on a lot of people's mind, um, and in fact, I, you know, the, some, the questions that Godfrey put up at the beginning uh, address this is, well, how will consumers feel? And so Aqua, Adva Aqua Bounty has conducted consumer research in the United States and Canada, and here's just some of the, the results that, come, that have come back. Um, there is a there's a general openness to trying Aqua Advantage salmon. Um, the the point that uh, one of the key numbers right here, seventy percent of the respondents. And by the way, this was um, this were, these were internet surveys, and I well over a thousand respondents, uh, a thousand participants in the surveys. Um, so um, about 70% are likely to purchase and try the, the product at least once. Over 80% were neutral to the concept and, and uh, the, um, the fact that it's genetically modified. And so that speaks quite, you know, I think that's very good news for all of us who work in livestock and with livestock biotechnology that um, there is a growing recognition that technology is important um, in the production of food. Um, I do think that the current environment that we're all in with uh, the global pandemic has made, a, has made it more obvious to many people that our supply chains can be at risk um, and that being able to produce protein efficiently and more locally is a positive thing. Um, so here's the picture. This is a, a picture of our Indiana farm um, operation. This is the final stage. Uh, it's called Grow Out. And just the point I wanted to make from this is that we, we have both non-transgenic and transgenic fish uh, moving through the farm and that our on-farm results, large scale commercial, are actually better than what was, you know, what we had forecast based on research. So we're, we're moving forward. We're pleased with the, the way the product is performing in commercial settings, and we're looking forward to bringing it to market here in a few months in the United States. And then just uh, quickly for, you know, about Aqua Bounty. Uh, so we have the, the farm in Indiana, our hatcheries up in Canada. We are in the planning process right now for the next farm in the United States, um, and we're we we're down to we're designing the footprint of the the farm and uh, picking the locations. And this this next farm will be about ten times the size in terms of uh, production capacity of the existing farm in Indiana. Um, we're also active internationally. We have um, research trials getting ready to start in China. Uh, and we're working with regulators in China, Israel, and Brazil right now um, for, um, to, for approvals to begin trials in those other countries and, and potentially to produce uh, Aqua Advantage salmon uh, outside the United States. So I think that's it for me. Um, Aqua, Aqua Bounty is, is very... I'm uh, very pleased to, to have transited through the, the process of getting a product, a genetically engineered product into the marketplace. Um, we're excited about what the, the opportunities are for the product um, and, and what it means for 
for agriculture, what it means for sustainability, and what it means for livestock biotechnology and demonstrating that technology can be used to secure, you know, for food security purposes, uh, improve environmental impact, uh, reduce environmental impact of, of uh, livestock. So thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. That is so exciting. A big congrats. It's to Aqua Bounty for that effort. We are all looking forward to enjoying that salmon. But now, participants, we are still having a challenge with the Simon. Oh, Simon is yeah, back. I'm Simon, uh, your network is back. No, ah, I'm, I'm, I'm using my phone as a hotspot. Sincere apologies, everyone. Uh, the whole institute's gone down. We're dark. Sorry about that, but uh, let's see if you can make it in 10 minutes. I will do my best. Thank you. Okay. So. Okay, so sorry, I missed the last couple of talks or the majority thereof. Um, I'm going to talk to you about editing livestock genomes and the potential for genome editors. Um, so selective breeding applied throughout the course of animal husbandry has been responsible for a vast breed diversity that we observe today. And selective breeding is also the driver behind the spectacular productivity gains that we've observed in Western agriculture. So that's exemplified here in growth of broiler chickens, productivity in pig production and milk yield. This is U um, the UK dairy herd. While genomic selection does continue to form the foundation of many commercial breeding programs, it's limited by the genetic pool of the population that's under selection. So in essence, if your trait of interest isn't encoded in the genome of your breeding population, you can't select for it. And genome editing has the potential to offer an effective solution to this problem. So what is genome editing? Well, just as editing is the act of rewriting text, genome editing is the act of rewriting the genome. Using genome editors such as zinc finger nucleases, talons, or the CRISPR-Cas system, researchers can break the genome at a specified locus and effectively rewrite the DNA sequence at this position. It's worth noting that what I'm about to give is a very basic overview and that more nuanced tools have been developed that allow researchers to create breaks on only one strand of the DNA, or to modify methylation status, or to transiently turn genes on and off. Um, however, for this talk, I'm going to focus on applications involving double strand breaks. So once you've created your double strand break, there are two main routes that you can use to resolve that break. Firstly, you can choose to do nothing further and rely on the cell's non-homologous end joining pathway to fix the break. Now, this pathway is notoriously error prone and you get small DNA insertions or deletions at the break site when it's resolved. And if the break is within a protein coding gene, um, sorry, within the protein coding sequence of a gene, this typically results in disruption of gene expression. And it's very useful if your question simply is what happens when we turn this gene off? The second possibility is that you can do something by way of supplying an exogenous DNA template to the cell. So in this case, you can use an oligonucleotide or you can use a plasmid that the cell can use as a template for reparation of the break. And using this approach, you can change anything from a single base up to insertion of a transgene at the break site. A third opportunity is to use pairs of genome editors in tandem, flanking a region of interest. And using this approach, you can efficiently excise the region in between. And what I'm going to do now is give you examples whereby each of these approaches has been used for agricultural purposes in livestock. So my first two examples relate to porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome. Um, caused by the porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome virus. This disease causes late stage abortion in sows, death of young piglets and a failure to thrive in older animals. It is a major impact on global pig production. 
and in the EU alone, so in this little region down here, it's estimated to cost about 1.5 billion euros in productivity loss annually. The PERS virus infects porcine monocytes and macrophages through interaction with a cell surface protein called CD163. Um, CD163 has nine extracellular domains, which I've shown here, and you can visualize these as nine different beads sitting on a string. And the PERS virus binds specifically to bead number five. Now, this cartoon depicts the genomic structure, the exonic structure of the gene encoding the CD163 protein, with domain five being encoded entirely and exclusively by exon number seven. In 2016, Randy Prather's group published their work on the use of the CRISPR-Cas system to disrupt the porcine CD163 gene. So they used a non-homologous end joining approach to introduce frame shifts in the gene so the protein isn't expressed anymore. And they created, as I say, pigs that lacked CD163 protein. And when you challenge these pigs, so these are wild type pigs on the top and the CD163 null pigs at the bottom. When you challenge these with the PERS virus, you can see that the wild type pigs develop respiratory signs and they develop fever, but the null pigs do not. And when you take the lungs out of these pigs at necropsy, so this is the wild type and this is the null, you can see that the immune cell infiltration that characterizes the disease in the wild type pig is absent in the pigs that lack CD163. So this is a really clear demonstration that the edited pigs couldn't be infected with the virus. Now, CD163 has a number of important functions, including hemoglobin, haptoglobin scavenging, and a number of roles in inflammation. And as such, we believe that while functional knockout of CD163 is a very useful step towards understanding PERS resistance in pigs, it's unlikely to be desirable in production animals. Um, as I mentioned previously, the domain to which the virus binds is encoded by exon 7. So at Roslyn, we took a novel approach and applied a pair of guides flanking, so this is CRISPR-Cas system, with guides flanking exon 7 such that we snipped it out. The idea being that you'd get exon skipping from 6 to 8, you'd still get protein expressed, but without the bit of the protein that the virus binds to. So now, when the virus comes along, there's nothing for it to bind to, therefore it can't invade the cell. So to test out our hypothesis, we generated a small number of animals. So we had a cohort of eight, four well type animals and four animals that were homozygous for the exon 7 deletion. And we challenged both cells from these pigs and the pigs themselves with PERS virus and showed that like the Missouri group CD163 disrupted pigs, ours that lack domain five, which are these green lines at the bottom, can't be infected with the virus, whereas the wild types uh, pigs were. Now, for the final example that I'm gonna talk about, um, we're looking at homology directed repair at the target site. And for this, I'm gonna use cattle as the exemplar species. So in Western agriculture, horns on cattle are largely considered problematic. And this is because they are in effect offensive weapons and um, cattle bearing them can cause significant harm either to other cattle or to their handlers. And most dairy breeds, such as this Holstein Frisian, have horns. And as such, disbudding either with caustic pastes or hot irons or dehorning in older animals is common practice. And as this is often performed without analgesia, it's clearly a welfare issue. There is a natural genetic mutation called Celtic Pult in which 212 base pairs of coding, uh, sorry, of non-coding sequence found on Bostaurus chromosome one that you find in horned animals is duplicated and replaces 10 base pairs proximal to the 212. So when you get this duplication, polled animals don't have horns, whether they are heterozygote or homozygote for the 
um, Celtic Pold Alley. So the research team at Recombinetics um, used this observation to edit the locus in horned dairy cattle. Um, they inserted the 212 base pair region, essentially replicating the Celtic Pold in an animal that didn't normally have Celtic Pold. They produced two bull calves and both of these animals were polled and when they were bred against horned cows their offspring were polled so it fitted with expectations. So again a powerful demonstration that in a single generation you can introduce an allele and therefore a phenotype of interest into your species or breed of interest. Um, just to finish off, as far as I'm aware, all three of the examples that I've just been given are the subject of ongoing discussions with regulators in a number, number of different jurisdictions. And, oh, I've forgotten that that was there. So this is one of the, the polled cattle. And I just want to finish with this slide. Um, genome editors, whichever flavour we are talking about, whether it be zinc fingers, talons or CRISPR, they are tools. They are tools that allow us to modify the genome at a user specified locus. And because of the potential opportunities afforded primarily in the human health arena, there's been considerable resource expended on design and redesign of these reagents. And the evolution of this tool set is likely co to continue for the foreseeable future. From a regulatory perspective, it's important to understand that there is a spectrum of modifications that can be introduced using genome, and, uh, genome editors, ranging from a single base change through to insertion of large, large transgene elements. And determination of where edited morphs into transgenic is going to be a uh, a really key determination for regulators to make. So in the European Union, for example, a single base change if made on purpose goes through the same regulatory process as if it were a transgenic animal. And with that, I'm going to stop for now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Simon, for those insights. Definitely very, very useful in our discussion. And thank God the technology has worked. So uh -huh. I'll now hand over to Ola, who will moderate the Q&A session. Thank you. So for the three uh -huh. panelists, I hand you over to Ola. Uh, you're in good hands. <laughs> good evening, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Now, uh, I'm very excited about moderating this because uh, everybody knows I'm a crop scientist. But I'm learning a lot coming from uh, the science, with a science background, and I have an, an animal science course during my undergrad. I'm trying to get back to all of those sciences. So I, I'm, um, it is very impressive that in animal biotechnology, all of uh, the, the objectives are being met. We are looking at productivity and food sustainability with resistance to trypanosoma and then uh, the production of um, uh, aqua bounty salmon in a shorter time than the usual. And of course, resistance to diseases and uh, the improvement of genetics. I have received a lot of questions. And so um, I'm going to ask, uh, well, unluckily most of these questions, we cannot just generalize this. It's very specific to the scientist to whom the question will be. So uh, we're going to start with questions for Steve Kim, and, uh, and then uh, we go forward to Walter and then to, to Simon. So the first question for Steve Kemp came out as, um, what is the role of uh, biotechnology in the improvement of animal genetic resources in developing countries. Development of genetics is one of your objectives and you have uh, found that it can be done in uh, animal biotechnology. Please, Steve. Okay. Y yeah, so I mean, uh, I mean, one of the, so one of the issues in, in developing countries is that uh, livestock 
tend to be very well adapted and uh, but not very productive. Uh, and combining those two together using conventional methods is is problematic because uh, if, for instance, we if we want to introduce if we want to improve milk production, for instance, in a, an Ancoli, an Ancoli is a very tough animal, doesn't produce much milk. If we want to, if we cross it with a Frisian, uh, then we have a we, we have a, a reasonably good F1. But then after that, it all begins to fall apart. Uh, subsequent generations, you get start to get segregation, uh, and and you're you're dragging a lot of not very helpful genes. You know. You, by crossing with a Frisian, you're only after a handful of genes, and what you're doing is dragging a lot of very inappropriate genes in in with that cross. So, so the expectation is that um, the, the genome editing technologies can allow you to be really precise and say and and fix particular aspects uh, of. Uh, of either you could either take a well adapted animal and, and improve its productivity by a number of very specific edits or you could do the reverse take a very productive animal and make it resilient with a, a number of, of, of very specific edits um yeah i don't know if that answers the question yeah i think so because he had uh, the the person who who questioned this is on the curve was them hossein and uh, you have already responded to the succeeding questions that he raised it's on genome editing and how it is not going to be used for selection breeding and uh, the improvement of genetics. Now let's move to uh, Walter, uh, Dr. Mark Walton. The question is uh, from Paige Kletter, and it is uh, investment in tank-based culture facilities for salmon is currently soaring, so it's very expensive. How would this also raise opportunities for wider adoption of the aqua advantage, aqua advantage salmon world, worldwide? If the tank culture is expensive, so um, thank you, Ola. And, and so the way I'm going to interpret that question is, uh, or, or respond to that question, aqua advantage salmon because of the faster growth rate. And, and the, the greater feed efficiency. So the less time in the water and less feed to get a, a kilo of protein, that makes the, the return on your RAS, on, on the RAS investment much greater. And so we think that Aqua Advantage is in fact a key, will be a key factor in the, the continued growth of uh, recirculating systems and specifically for salmon um, in not in the United States and beyond and that's why we're looking globally and so the questioners point about it's growing it's it's growing quite significantly is absolutely right on there's a lot of money being invested we think that aqua advantage and we're investing as well in in the systems that aqua advantage is a key the, the salmon itself the genetics are a key to making that system profitable Yes, I agree with you. And then to Simon, uh, how common are similar duplications of genes in cattle in nature? That's why you need to have the, the polled one, as shown from the GE hornless cattle that you presented. So how, how common is the duplications? I have absolutely no idea, I'm afraid. That's a really easy answer for me to give. I, I don't know. So the, the Celtic polled itself, a lot of dairy breeds have Celtic polled, but sorry, a lot of beef breeds have Celtic polled, but most of the dairy breeds don't. Mm. And in the dairy where they do have it, it tends to be animals of relatively low merit. So it's really difficult to get it into high merit animals by breeding. Um, with respect to the question itself, I don't know the answer how often duplications occur. Sorry. Okay. All right. Uh, another question to you. Uh, what are the field level feasibility for production of horn based dairy cattle from genome edited cell lines? Field level feasibility. How is it feasible if you do it in large scale, for example? Um, so this isn't a project that I was involved in myself. It was done via cloning. To do this via cloning. So if you wanted to do this into your breed of interest deriving some fibroblasts that you could modify would not be too challenging but you would need to 
probably have a company like Recombinetics who have the expertise in cloning involved in the process. Okay, so we need more expertise than that. You, you, would, you would need more expertise than you would normally find, for example, in a university laboratory. You need to have the, the ability to carry out the cloning. Yeah, but if you have already produced several and you would want to produce in a large scale, is that possible? <laughs> yeah, you just breed them. It, okay. it just it feeds into a breeding population. So as long as you put this into really um, relatively good merit animals, you could just take semen from the bulls, which are homozygous, and all of their offspring will be pulled. Okay, that's a good answer. Thank you. Uh, can we call in back uh, Professor Steve Camp? Are you still there? <laughs> I'm still here. Okay. Still on the beach. <laughs> so what are the advantages of surrogate sires to cloning as compared to cloning? When you did your experiments in, um, is it sires? Yes. Yes, surrogate sires. Yes. So, uh, so the advantage is that um, that, that it, it multiplies the the way of delivering the genes, if you like. So, mm -hmm. so if we produce one, for for example, if we worked on trypanosome resistance, uh, uh, um, a lot of work might give us a, a handful of animals um, that would have been achieved by implanting uh, embryos uh, into recipients, and each one would be very expensive and very slow to produce. Um, but if some of those were, well, in fact, we designed them all to be males, uh, but so, so then to exploit those and, and, and make them available to farmers would, would be very, very time consuming. You'd have to, you would have to then uh, expand the herd uh, dramatically mm -hmm. and, and or rely on artificial insemination, which in turn relies on infrastructure, um, such mm -hmm. as liquid nitrogen production. Uh, which across most of Africa does not work very well. It's, it's one of the biggest constraints. And so using the surrogate sire system allows you to, uh, allows you to sort of have, have any old random animal, any old random male uh, um, delivering very high quality and precisely uh, defined uh, uh, genetics in order to, to improve your herd. So rather than trying to send semen frozen in liquid nitrogen, completely reliant on liquid nitrogen, completely reliant on identifying heat and then AI technicians to turn up in the right place at the right time. You just distribute males who just go and do their thing. Okay. One of the questions that can be answered by you three would be, um, can you ask, oh, this is from Dr. Gra uh, Graham Brooks. Can you ask all speakers to comment on the current state of regulation of GM and GE, animal traits in important large countries like the EU, China, and the US. So this is um, what's happening on regulation. This is what we have been discussing in, in our Philippine Animal Biotech uh, the last three days. So is there uh, any one of you who can start uh, talking about it or have a bird's eye view? Yes, uh, Dr. Simon So from the point of the EU, as I mentioned on my last slide, any purposeful modification of the genome. So if you know what you're doing, if you're changing specifically a single base or you're breaking the genome at a specific locus on purpose, it's all regulated as though it's transgenic. Yeah. But other jurisdictions around the world have made different um, determinations on that. Uh, so I can, I can jump in on the US and, and we're actually in a fairly similar place to what Simon just described for the EU. Officially, the Food and Drug Administration, the agency responsible for biotechnology animals, have said any purposeful modification that goes through a regulatory process, now through the, the regulatory process. Um, there has been some movement on their part to consider 
simple edits, for example, the polled um, from Recombinetics as something that could be looked at differently than a transgenic product like the Aqua Advantage. But right now, we still officially would go through a full evaluation and regulatory process in the U.S. Uh, but, and to, point, and to, to Simon's point as well about other jurisdictions, so for example, both Brazil and Argentina have determined there, there was uh, a tilapia um, line for developed that is a myostatin knockout and they looked at that using editing techniques and they both of those countries looked at that those fish and said um, we don't need to regulate those those could have occurred naturally so we will there's no additional regulatory requirement so different jurisdictions certainly are doing things differently yes precisely uh, we have something to add Steve Dr. <laughs> Well, I would just say that I guess as, as far as I'm aware across Africa, where there are well-established regulatory <laughs> systems, they are, they're essentially dealing with on, on a case by case basis. Uh, and there isn't an overarching uh, rule uh, such as, such as Mark and Simon have just described. So, I mean, if we came to them with a, a genetic, a genome edited animal, uh, with, for instance, with an edit that could have occurred naturally, then they don't have a rule book that just says how that would how they would react to that. They would they would on a, on a case by case basis look at the look at the safety and no doubt be influenced by uh, by uh, thinking in the U.S. and Europe. Yeah, so confusing at this time yet. So still have to be. we have a lot of uh, harmonization and. Uh, further thinking on the science. Now here's a question from Ryan Bedford, USDA Manila for Dr. Mark Walton. Uh, would you ever have hatcheries in the, in the US too? I think you have, right? And here in the Philippines, we're seeing more born and raised restrictions being placed on meat imports. So I wonder if that would be an issue for your salmon in some foreign markets. So. Okay. So um, two things. One, we don't have a hatchery in the United States yet. All of our hatchery facilities are in Canada. Um, the company will the, the company will establish a hatchery outside of Canada, probably in the U.S. as we go forward. Um, to to the question about import, so actually uh, the the Aqua Bounty business model is not to produce and export. It would be to produce in country. Uh, that's the real advantage. That's one of the real advantages of being able to produce uh, in a land-based system. Uh, so, for example, if the Philippines the Philippines was a market that the company chose to enter, we would we would intend to put a farm in the Philippines rather than um, to produce in some other country and then export to the Philippines. Yeah, that's right. And then uh, to to you again, Mark. Uh, this is a question from uh, Dr. Violeta Villegas, one of our science and review panelists in the Philippines. It took 10 years to get FDA approval for the GM salmon, but now we're having the fruits of it and uh, there's a lot of acceptance. So what hurdles did you have to overcome to finally get this approved? So, so the... Yeah. The primary hurdle in a lot of ways was that when Aqua Bounty first started the regulatory process, there was no defined pathway for uh, approval of a genetically modified animal. And so to, just as Steve was saying about in, in countries in Africa that don't have a playbook, it's on a case by case, Aqua Bounty was essentially the first case um, for FDA. And so part of that length of time was the, the system coming into place and then the regulators really thinking through, all right, so if we're going to use this particular paradigm, how does that apply to a genetically modified fish? And for Aqua Bounty to go, oh, okay, so what kinds of questions do we actually have to be thinking about as we, as we go through this process so that we can get the right data? And then I won't discount the fact there were some politics involved. And it wasn't politics in, at the agency, it was politics around the whole concept of genetically modified animals so that that added some time to the process as well yeah we've been following that actually here in the Philippines yeah. uh, here's a question for Steve Kemp 
Um, given that genetic modification methods for poultry are different than those from cattle and fish, how likely is it that we will see GM, GE breed, GM, oh, sorry, GE and GM breeds in the near future, such as the influenza resistant chicken? Uh, I think I think the technology is is different, but it's 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 equally advanced in in both systems. Uh, and and in fact, I, I mentioned the use of PGCs to to preserve diversity. And in fact, the reasons we were working on PGCs was not originally to conserve diversity, but was as a vehicle for for genome editing. So those are those are well established and. And in fact, uh, Mike McGrew in Roslyn is, is currently doing some, some proof of principle genome editing in, in, in chickens. So yeah, I, I, there's, they're, in some ways they're easier to work with because they're, they're, their shorter generation span makes it makes them much, much, much easier. Okay, yes. And then for uh, Simon, uh, this is from Peter Wahinia. Could you kindly comment on the sustainability of gene editing technology in relation to possible gene interaction, especially in the developing countries where animals are not challenged by disease, but by extreme weather. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That, that's a difficult one, I think. Um, <laughs> yeah. So if you don't have disease challenge, I would challenge whether you need to have disease resistant animals, but I'm, I'm presuming that disease challenge is common throughout the world. I know PERS in pigs, for example, is a global disease of pigs. With respect to environmental resilience, there are projects that we're working on now to improve that in cattle, for example, we're looking at a phenotype called slick, where the animals are more resilient when you thermally stress them. Um, essentially, if you have a good understanding of the genome phenome relationship and you can identify traits of interest, you can move those between breeds within a species relatively easily using genome editors, so long as it's at this time anyway, not a vastly polygenic trait. So the examples that I gave were all monogenic. So a single gene of yes. large effect. As I said again on my last slide, the tools are evolving and the efficiencies with which we will be able to make multiple changes at the same time are improving. But at the moment, all of the examples going through tend to be monogenic. I don't know if that answered the question at all. Yeah, I think uh, that's the essence because we are limited with the type of yeah, genes that are going to be edited and going to be changed. If it's polygenic, it's difficult. And Steve, are you raising your hand? I, I could chip in there, there if you like. I, I would, yes, please. I, I would say that disease resistance or tolerance disease is always a factor. Uh, all, all, all of us and all organisms are exposed to, to disease. And, just, and if you don't see disease, that means you have, you have resistance and, and a sort of stable adaptation. And in fact, and there's some very cool work that shows that, shows that innate immune response is very closely linked to, to overall productivity, even in the absence of disease. So I, I, I think the, the, me the message is that uh, adaptation to both pathogens and environment are, are always going to be important. Yeah, I agree with you. Now, uh, I think this is for the three of you. Uh, if you have already some uh, GM or genome edited animals, which are already growing in your experimental fields or in your experimental farms, and you uh, compare it with the wild type, uh, do you see any uh, changes or differences in their resistance on um, certain diseases? For example, uh, the aquabody salmon, uh, do you see the, any effect of the improvement in productivity in terms of disease resistance, for example, or for, um, for, for any animals that you have developed? 
which are uh, already growing or um, developing in your farms? And do you see how they, they respond to disease and pests in your fields compared to the wild type? You want me to start since you, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll give you a quick answer. So um, one of the real advantages of working in a land-based recirculating system is we don't expose our fish to the same disease organisms or parasitic um, challenges that they would that they would be exposed to in the open ocean. And so um, we don't have those diseases in our system and we have not conducted any trials. There's, there's no reason to expect that ours would be any different than the wild type. Um, so anything that would affect a wild type Atlantic salmon, we would expect that if we put our fish in that environment, they would have those same issues. But in, in a recirculating system, we simply don't expose, they are not exposed to those challenges. Okay, because there's no tax. Do you have any comment on that, Simon? Yep, so with our CD163 pigs, um, I'll comment first on the Missouri group CD163. So when they've made a functional knockout of CD163, they report that they have seen no difference in growth, but their facility is relative, a relatively clean research facility. So. I don't think they've looked exhaustively, but they haven't seen anything or they haven't reported seeing anything untoward. For our domain five knockout pigs, they're on our farm, which is not a clean facility. It, it's, it's not a commercial farm, but it's open to the elements. We've had a number of generations and we haven't seen that the domain five deletion knockout animals are any more or less susceptible to any infections that occur in our normal farming environment than the wild type counterparts. Okay, yes. But I think it, it, it's an important question and I think going forward, the onus is on the breeding company who is going to be marketing this to do that challenge series of challenges with well-known pathogens to check otherwise they're going to have real problems down the line farmers are going to lose faith in the product definitely and steve do you have any addition please no i wish i did but we don't have any any live trips resistant animals on the ground at the moment uh, we mm -hmm. have a we have a cloned animal uh with an n equals one and he's very happily charging around in the paddocks uh, but it's probably not statistically significant. Okay, but there first another question for you. How do you plan to efficiently resurrect the cryopreserved PGC of chicken since chimeras can be produced if female PGC will be transferred to a male testis tank? So this is from Marcus Valdez from the Philippines. Ah, great question. <laughs> So you you produce a, a at the moment we have to go through through a chimera stage, but again uh, Mike McGrew is is working on on producing a a surrogate recipient uh, uh, exactly equivalent to the surrogate sire system that I described in uh, uh, in in uh, in dotes that uh, that uh, John Oakley is working on. So so that correct that is that is the big delay at the moment that we end up with a, with uh, with a chimeric bird and we have to go through several rounds of breeding to get to, to filter out uh, the original the, sorry to filter out the genetics that we need but uh, we intend to move to a surrogate sire and indeed a surrogate dam system for that. Mm -hmm. and here's another one for you before uh, we go to simon uh, which is most expensive or effective for an animal industry in a developing country? Animal biotechnology to use natural variation to improve performance, making improved genetics available to farmers, or conserve unique diversity? This is wow. from Orton Doc from the Philippines. Wow, those are three very different things. I, I, I don't. I don't think there's an answer to those. I mean, all three, all three are necessary. I have no idea how to say, how to compare them. I mean, of, the, of those, one of those is easy. It, 
yeah, well, for, I mean, the final one of, of the important of, of conserving diversity, uh, it costs you nothing to lose diversity until you need it. And then mm -hmm. it could cost you everything. Um, so that's one of those things that's really, it's really difficult to know how much diversity you need to conserve. Uh, I mean, there are people who argue you don't need to do it at all, that there's always going to be, no matter what you do, there's always going to be enough diversity that you could, that you could selectively breed for any, any characteristic you want. And there are others who say you must preserve absolutely everything. Uh, I suspect the answer is somewhere in between. Yeah, I guess you have to use every possible way of uh, performing the uh, getting performance improved. Yeah, all of this. And now a question to Simon from Luis Camargo: What is your expectation in performing editing in multiple targets in one generation? And what is your opinion about using in vitro fertilization instead of animal cloning to generate genome edited livestock in terms of efficiency? Okay, so I've already forgotten part of the question. I'll start with the first part. Thanks, Luis. Um, multiple targets at the same time. It is going to depend a little bit on the tools that you try to employ to do it and whether the targets are sitting on the same chromosome or on the same arm of the same chromosome. Mm -hmm. So if you have two targets in proximity to each other and you're creating double strand breaks, what's likely to happen is that a lot of the time you'll just delete what's in between them. And the mm -hmm of creating deletions, even large deletions, is pretty high. If you've got changes on different chromosomes, it would really come down to your efficiencies of your editor reagents. Um, as simple as that. And as I said, the, the tools are evolving. So we have prime editors now, which on paper at least, look extremely promising that will allow us to tether a target molecule onto the end of the guide sequence for the CRISPR-Cas and have that reverse transcribed and integrated at the cut site. I haven't tried it yet myself. It looks like it should work very well. But, you know, the, the field is moving quickly and the examples I gave are the easy stuff that came early that is coming to fruition now. What was the second part of the question, Ola? No, I cannot find it anymore. <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, the question is, um, what is uh, using in vitro fertilization instead of animal cloning, and what is the efficiency? How do you compare the efficiency? So at Roslyn, I, I personally don't have experience of cloning, right? Ro Roslyn has a history of cloning, but we don't do it anymore because the efficiency of cloning is not very good. Okay. It, it's a balancing act. If you do cloning, then you know that the cells that you're putting in are likely to have the edits that you're interested in, but your efficiency yeah. of generating an animal is quite low. Right. The way we do it, we introduce our genome editors into an IVF zygote. Okay, already. The efficiency of producing animals is pretty high, but the efficiency of getting your editing event will be largely limited by the availability of your locusts in those cells to the editors and how efficient your editors are. So at the moment, it, it's a balancing act. There is no, this is better than this. It's uh, everyone's trying their own methodology at the moment. I prefer the IVF route because that's what I know. But there are a lot of groups doing cloning because that's what they know. Mm -hmm. Yes, precisely. And then uh, last two questions for Mark. Um, Mark, uh, there are two questions for you. One is, is it possible to bring about the salmon to Africa? And the next one would be, um, uh, can you comment on the US court case 
on the attempts by uh, people against GM animals trying to stop the commercialization of aquabanta salmon due to ecological risk? Ah, okay. So uh, on the first, the first question, it's it's entirely feasible to bring to take aqua advantage to any place that um, one you have to have a regulatory uh, be able to get a regulatory approval so working with the regulators and and uh, a willingness to, to look at the product and then two it's an investment um, uh, recirculating systems are not inexpensive um, and so and, and especially for a cold water species like um, aqua advantage uh, are like like salmon, so you know we need water that's our, our fish grow in water that's around 12 degrees, 12 to 14 centigrade. So and you know it depends on where you were on the continent of Africa, uh, Sahara. You know I mean equatorial might be kind of really expensive because of the, just the temperatures, but it's it's feasible. And the only thing I can say about the court case is that it is ongoing. Um, and then uh, the the one the one clarification that I would make to the questioner is that what the the plaintiffs have actually charged or are, are pursuing is that the Food and Drug Administration didn't do its work under its environmental work as appropriately as it should have. They weren't actually trying to stop the you know not try to, well they haven't deliberately asked to stop the, the commercialization. They're just saying they weren't sure that FDA got the, the environmental review done correctly. So. Oh, OK. Anyway, uh, since we are running out of time, uh, I'd like to ask uh, you, our uh, respective panelists, to provide your, uh, to give us your last messages or uh, take home messages coming out from your talks, uh, ones which will um, be implanted in our minds on how important animal biotechnology is in uh, food sustainability, disease resistance, and, and others. We can start, uh, Dr. Steve Kemp. Thank you for springing that on me. Uh, yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I, would, I would come back to, to diversity. That is the source of any adaptability, and we're in a rapidly changing world. Demands are changing, populations are moving, populations are growing, uh, disease demands are changing all the time. We're in an incredibly dynamic environment. And, and you know, biotechnology offers us the opportunity, uh, getting better and better, to, to understand the basis of adaptation and to deliver adaptation quickly to people who need it urgently. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Thank you. And Simon? Uh, I, I would echo what Steve's just said. Um, the, the genome editors certainly give us the opportunity to introduce one or two or three or four genetic modifications into a population that doesn't have them without the genetic drag that Steve was talking about earlier of crossing a, a different breed with your breed of interest. So it maintains breed diversity, but just introduces the good bits that you're interested in. But we're, we're, still, we're still on the learning curve of the genome phenome, and we're still on the development stage of the genome editor reagents. So there's, there's a lot ahead of us. There's far more ahead than there is behind us in this field. Thank you. And Walter, Mark. Mark. So I think what I would leave, the, the thought I want to leave with everyone is um, to, to have a positive outlook on the ability to bring these products to a biotechnology livestock developed through biotechnology to market. I think Aqua Bounty and Aqua Advantage Salmon are in fact the exemplar of that right now. It shows if you persevere, if you work with the regulators that you can. And I know from my interactions 
including you know, Ola with you and, and others, um, regulators around the world are aware of um, gene, ed gene edited and, and genetically modified livestock. They are looking at ways of regulating those. I think there's a real movement in most of the world to say an understanding that these products will have real value um, and that the regulators are there to work with us. And so persevere, hang in there and go forward. Yes, definitely. With that, I thank all of our panelists and I'm turning the floor to Margaret, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And Godfrey, please uh, run the last poll question. There you go. I will end this poll in the next 10 seconds and show the results. All right, uh, ending the poll now. One more, uh, 10 more seconds. All right. Do you scroll a bit on the second question? The screen? Second question, I'm on the second question. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right, I see quite a number has voted, so I'm ending this and showing the results. There you go. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so very much. I now invite our global coordinator, Dr. Maha, as usual, to give us a concluding remark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Margaret Karembu. It was really fulfilling to see this exciting and enriching, far sighted discussion that we had. ISA is always happy to facilitate such dis discussions on biotechnology and agriculture and animal biotechnology is something that's inevitable. In, it just has to be part of the toolkit to address the many challenges that we face. It could be climate change, food security, or even animal welfare. ISA will continue to play a key role in facil facilitating decision-making process by supporting knowledge transfer, exchange of information, and alleviating um, fake news and pseudoscience. Let us all learn from the mistakes that we have done in crop biotechnology. There is still so much of public engagement work to be done in the area of animal biotechnology, and we need to do this quick. We need scientists to speak up and play a role in influencing public opinion. If not, the agenda will be taken up by others for their interest. So let, us, let science guide us and let us also promote trust and transparency. ISA is committed to work with all stakeholders to promote informed decision-making process. Our speakers gave the key takeaway messages. One of mine is animal biotechnology holds a lot of potential and many areas that needs to be explored. And here is where the youth should come on board and uh, start value adding and contributing for a better future. With that, I would really like to thank our speakers for taking your time and putting all this very rich information together. And thank you for the participants as well for the active participation. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. The seminar is over. We'll continue the discussion over the next webinar, which will be announced in due course. Thank you.